Hi, everybody. We are coming to you from the, de the what is this, the garden of the Kelly Writers House here. Uh, for a couple more weeks, we'll be in the garden, then we'll be back in the Arts Cafe. And it's about 200% humidity here. I don't know where, I mean, you, I'm hoping that people watching this are in a dry place, because we're not in a dry place. A uh, couple of uh, announcements, then we'll get started talking about week three poems. And at the end of my announcements, I'm just going to list the poems and take a poll and see who's interested in talking about what. But we'll take calls. And Zach, what's the number? 610? Chris? 610. 610. 610-616-3208. And Zach, this today, the first caller, the first caller is getting this brand new anthology by, some, by two people, one of whom we know very well, Angela Hume, who was a TA in Modpo a few years ago. Uh, and it's called Eco Poetics. And Davey, say a quick word about this book. <laughs> Anthology of really awesome essays by poet critics who work on a really wide range of experimental poetry who are thinking about the relationship between the ecological and experimental poetic form. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so we have Anna here to my left. Hello, Anna. Hey, Al. And we have Lily. Hi, Lily. Hello. And we have driving all the, no, taking a train all the way up from Washington, one of the original Mod Poers. A dear friend, though we only see him maybe once or twice a year, and that's Ray Maxwell. Snaps for Ray Maxwell. And Ray's going to be at the table today. Uh, we have, uh, J in the Hangouts, we have Jason. Good morning, Jason. Good morning. And we have Erica, I believe. Hi, Erica. Hey, Al. Coming to us from the absolute, oh! Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> Wait, is that related to our, our, our poems today? Are there early. any Ewoks in our poems? She's a week early. <laughs> She's a week early. <laughs> oh, that's Basket. That's mm -hmm. Stein's dog. Wow, she must be terribly old. Um, <laughs> and Molly, coming to us from Los Angeles, where it is 7.04 in the morning. Hello, Molly. It sure is. Good morning. Hi. It's great to see you. I love nice the blue walls. Too. Thanks. Yeah. OK, you got your coffee? Yeah, good. Okay, <laughs> great. And we have Connie here, and Jonah, and Sophia, and B, and we have visiting us all the way from really like Taiwan and the Southeast Asia, and where she's a, becoming more and more an eminent journalist out there. We have Jess Yu way in the back. Hi, Jess. And we have Davy who is on the phones today, is also looking at Twitter. Hi, Davey. Hi, Al. And we have Chris and Zach. Now, Chris was here at before 8 a.m. setting up, because this is our, and Zach, this is our, our road show setup. And speaking of road show setup, a week from now, actually a week and a day from now, on Thursday, October, I want to say 4th, uh, Zach and Chris and Anna and I will have gone on the road actually not on the road, we will be flying over a road, many roads, to Montreal, Canada, Quebec. We are going to be coming to you live from uh, a wonderful location in Montreal. Uh, we, are, we will make sure we put out the word again. If you're in Toronto, if you're in Burlington, if you're in, I don't know where else, Niagara, please drive over to Montreal and hang out with us. We're going to do a webcast on Thursday at 6.30 local time, which I think is the same time as Philly, I think. I think an hour behind them. They might be an hour behind. There may be some weird Canadian-American relationship thingies about <laughs> savings time. I'm not sure. Up. Lily's going to look it up, because this is the kind of thing she likes. <laughs> Weather and time change, um, <laughs> among other things. And we're going to be there on Thursday, not Wednesday, coming to you live from Montreal. That doesn't mean you can't join us. It's the same old webcast. In fact, we've been using our road set up all along. So, OK. Um, this week, we are commenting on essays. And so far, it's been very wonderful and generous. Same and time in Montreal. I same suppose. time. <laughs> Thank you. 6.30, Philly time, New York time, Boston time, Montreal time. For all I know, Halifax time. No, not Halifax time. <laughs> OK. Um, this week, we're commenting on essays. I just wanted to shout out to one essay and try to cheerlead the idea that every one of us should go, whether you've written an essay or not, 
please go into the forums and please comment. Um, I'm going to just refer to Dominic Weston, who's I think a new mod poet, is certainly very active this year. He has written a, an essay called The Spy Who Loves Me. And <laughs> I'm just going to quote a sentence from it and then tell you about the responses so far. Um, here's partly what he writes about this extraordinary Dickinson poem. Dickinson employs this hypothetical spy as a device used to show us how the soul, rather than our own hearts or minds, so s use of the word spy with respect to hearts and minds, so people who are familiar with American foreign policy will know what that means, rather than our own hearts and minds, has all the tools necessary to get to the truth behind the facade, to build a compelling case and learn all the dark secrets of the soul that perhaps in other s circumstances could remain hidden. That is so fucking smart. Dominic Weston, I don't know who you are <laughs> or where you are, but we want you on our team. That is really so smart. And in fact, there's a piece of criticism which extends the conceit of spying really beautifully by, by talking about things that are remaining hidden, by dark secrets, talking about winning hearts and minds. It's really, really quite something. And all I'm here to say at the beginning of this uh, webcast is that three or four people have already responded, including Louisa, who doesn't go by a last name here, but who does uh, in Modpo, who's very active, and Erica Kaufman, our own Erica Kaufman, who wrote a very nice response to Dominic. I mean, I just got to say, Erica's at Bard College, and Erica... There are students at Bard who pay tens and tens and tens <laughs> upon tens of thousands of dollars of tuition to get that much attention from Erica Kaufman, and here she is providing it to someone for free. The world is <laughs> right. The world is good. Sorry, Bard. <laughs> um, and then Sharon Ingram, S.E. Ingram, a long time uh, mod poet whom we've met maybe twice in various locations on the road, actually once here, I think, and once in New York, writes a really, really nice response. And then, and I'll stop after this, Dominic Weston himself pipes up and says, Hi, S.E., Sharon. Thank you very much for the feedback, which I find greatly encouraging, as this is the first time I have tried to unpack Dickinson without the benefits of the TAs. I really like that, in part because... That's the purpose of the essays, which is to, to, to put the lie to the idea that you need all those videos of the TAs figuring everything out. In fact, we don't figure things out, do we, Anna? Not even close, right? That's why we're still talking about these same poems all these years later. So. <laughs> we know nothing. Because we know nothing. Okay, I'm going to list the poems, and then I'm going to invite people at the table and people in the hangouts to just say not anything about the poems, just pick a poem that you think <laughs> is worth talking about, and then we'll start right away because I think someone who's about to have a copy of Eco Poetics mm -hmm. has called us. And so here are the poems. In the main mod post syllabus, HD, C Rose. What a poem! What a poem! I hope we talk about it. HD, C Poppies. A little less of a brilliant thing, but so important to later in the course. So, C Poppies. Very similar to C. Rose. Pound in a station of the metro. Have we all talked about that enough? But maybe we'll talk again. Pound's the encounter. St Wallace Stevens' 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, which is not really imagism but cubism, but each one of the 13 is kind of imagist. Williams' lines, two lines. Uh, Williams' between walls, and this is just to say, and the red wheelbarrow. These are poems in the Williams section of our week, and here comes the sun. Uh, Marcel Duchamp did not write a poem, but he found a urinal. And isn't that basically the same thing? Yeah, Jason, it's the same. Put your thumb up if you think it's the same. Finding your, yep, okay, Jason <laughs> proves. And Nude descend of a Descending a Staircase, which is a painting, though they didn't like it at the time. People didn't want it. Uh, Williams, The Rose is Obsolete. That thing just blows off the top of the galaxy. Who knows what that's about? Uh, Williams, Portrait of Lady. In the... Uh, in the Modpo Plus syllabus, which is just hopping this week, I guarantee, I guarantee you'll have fun if you go to it. Uh, young, two versions of William's Young Woman at a Window, Pound's Portrait d'une Femme, which we talked about in London. That's a great video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Pound's Cantico del Soli, 
where you trouble the sleep of the proto-fascist. No, you trouble the sleep of Ezra Pound, American culture does. Pound's The River Merchant's Wife, Amy Lowell's The Letter, Ray Armentrout's Anti-Short Story, uh, Ray Armentrout's Postcards, Ray Armentrout's Essay, Cheshire Poetics, Williams' The Attic, which is Desire, sexy poem that Ray Armentrout loves, H.D. Epigram, H.D. Moonrise, H.D. Shelter Garden, Stevens' The Snowman, Stevens' Disillusionment of 10 O'Clock, Tom Leonard's riff on Williams, it's called Just to Let You Know, and what he does there in Scotland is he takes the beer, not the plums. All right, we're going around, starting with Anna. Just say a poem you think would be worth talking about today. Uh, I've been obsessed with HD's Oread this week. Oread, which I forgot to mention. Oread. <laughs> great, great poem. Lily. Uh, sheltered Garden. Me and Ojwala uh, just had a fun convo in my office hours about it. Great. That's a Modpo plus HD poem. Ray Maxwell. Get anything close to the mic. Oh, anything by HD. She's HD. awesome. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Davey? HD train also. HD Happy to talk train about is HD. leaving the station. Uh, Jason, poem. Um, I would say... I have to say two because one of them is tiny. Okay, Jason. Uh, For you, we, we always <laughs> make an exception. Say two. Um... Williams, the rose is obsolete. Yeah. And uh, Ray Armand Trout's anti short story. Oh, I love that poem. Okay, good. Uh, so, Jonah has the mic. You say one. Uh, Wallace Stevens, 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Okay, bird. great. So, these have been suggestions. Molly, what do you got? Uh, I would go back to Between Walls every Between time. Between Walls, the back wings of the hospital, where nothing will grow, lie cinders, Ray's not smiling, in which shine the broken pieces of a green bottle. Uh, Erica, that was great. I got to do my Williams imitation. I've got it off my chest. Erica? It only took me 14 minutes. Um, Please. Sheltered Garden. Sheltered Garden. Okay, great. Yeah, my office hour on that last night was great. Wow, everybody in office hours is talking about sheltered garden. Or there's did you combine? Well, you know, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> wow, that is so cool. Okay. Uh, so, Davey, who's on the phone? Uh, on the phone is Venetia, who is doing Modpo for the first time and is calling us from Denver and has two a two-part really wonderful question, both about... Well, I'll let Venetia tell you, but both about okay. this week and sort of about the arc of the course more broadly. Great. Wow. Venetia, can you hear me? I can. Hello, Al. Oh, hi. Chris, you've done a marvelous <laughs> job with the audio. You're amazing. Um, <laughs> Venetia, do you know you're getting a copy of this book? Um, I am not watching you online, but I bet you're waving a book. Would you like to surprise me or tell me? It's called Ecopoetics. The subtitle is Essays in the Field. It's edited by two marvelous people. And um, it's just really great. And since you, so we're going to send this to you. Make sure that when you're offline, you give Davey your mailing address, and we will mail it to you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. You didn't Yay. even know that was going to happen. Um, I didn't. Bonus. So listen, let me tell you about Eco Poetics in Denver. Have you thought about eco-poetics out there in Denver? I mean, if you just drive a little bit out of town, who needs a poem when you've got the eco? <laughs> Does that make any sense? <laughs> Quite a bit of sense, yes. OK. So you, have, you want to talk about the course, and you want to talk about other stuff. It's all yours. OK. Well, I had some concern that my question wasn't really part of what you cover in Modpo, because I'm new. Um, so far, I haven't seen anything, I don't think, talking about my question, which is the human side of poetry. So with, with imagism, I, want, I was curious when, we'll say Ezra Pound, or when, when somebody wants to start a movement, um, is, that, is that around a, a poet's or an artist's ego? Is it, is it like... In Pound's um, case, they, yes. Sorry. Okay. That was, okay. I was being snarky. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, are they, <clears throat> are they reacting against... So I know, you know, with images, and I believe I understand it's a reaction against 
romanticism, um, but is it also like a longing to get, you know, a longing towards something? To, yes. to is, is it something inside the human being that draws them toward creating a movement? And then the second part of the question, is there a, an equivalent of that today in poetry? Wow. Is, is there, do we, do we still do movements? Yes. Okay. Fantastic question. Could you stay on the line a little bit, and in the middle of asking my colleagues for responses to this, I might come back to you, and then you'll hang up so someone else can call? Does that sound like a good plan? It does. Okay. So I would like to use executive privilege and defer the second question and ask everybody to keep in mind as we go through the course that Venetia has asked it. And actually, maybe Venetia can drive from Denver to Philly and ask it in person at the end of the course, or, <laughs> ca or that was being funny, or call us again in week eight, nine, or 10, uh, when we would love to answer it. It would be the rest of the podcast, the rest of the webcast to answer it. But the first question might lead us to the second. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask for Erica first and then Anna. Um, let's talk about the human dimension, let's say, of these poems. Is there one? I think most would say yes. But Venetia isn't wrong to think that a movement that focused on focus, a movement that focused on rendering all things into perfectly viewed, perceived, precisely described objects, risks dehumanization. There's no doubt that there is a risk of dehumanization. And certainly I, I am responsible for rescuing the encounter, that poem by pound, from the middle of Cafe, I think it's in an early book. Nobody cares about that poem. I put it in there, and I've been teaching it for 30 years because it is such a great example of crossing the line in the realm of risks of objectification and um, dehumanization. Uh, so certainly there must be that tendency. So uh, Erica and then Anna, can you say a word about the human in these poems? <clears throat> That's a wonderful question. Um, as far as imagism goes, I think that I'm I'm tempted to say that I feel like these are some of the most human poems because the image that we're getting is coming to us via the poet. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, Williams, for example, like the red wheelbarrow. You're getting this description. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow. But it's it's generated by the speaker of the poem, which is human. I don't know if that's kind of a facile no, way it's of not thinking facile about it. But you know, the HD poem that we talked about in my office hours, which I hadn't read before, is an amazing poem, and the first two lines are both very eye centered. Yeah. Um, and set the poem up so that it feels incredibly human because it feels like this person, the speaker of the poem, is um overwhelmed by what humans make and wants to escape. That's so well put. It is responsive to Venetia's question, Erica, because the f one answer to the question is, where is the human? The answer is, in a poetry that seeks so, so, so supposed objectivity, there has got to be a subject, and the subject is a human subject. It's not artificial intelligence. That'll be for chapter 9.2. <laughs> Anna, what's your response to the question of humanity? I just want to add, and Venetia isn't doing this, but a lot of people who are skeptical about experimental poetry say, oh yeah, but I really like the poems. See, I'm not doing, this is not an imitation of you, Venetia. This is an imitation of some straw <laughs> person who says things like, why do you waste time, Ray, year after year studying these poems that you still don't know what they mean, and there's this, it's so inhumane. Well, I want my poem that makes me feel emotion about this lonely person standing in a field contemplating the dead flowers. Where's my poem about that? And none of these poems do that, I hope. Anna? Way to tee me up there. That was quite a setup. Thanks, Blue. Um, <laughs> so I guess I would, this, this, a version of this question came up in my office hours in the first week where um, we were, we had a conversation, me and someone else in my office hours had a conversation about um, sort of a, a version of this, which is that um, Emily Dickinson's poems felt impersonal, didn't feel like there was like a strong sense of like interiority or thought or like emotion coming from the poem. And I guess I would I would argue that 
I mean, I'm not in a position to like psychoanalyze why Ezra Pound would say something like, we have to make it new, or why Williams would be all excited about wheelbarrows. Not really in a position to psychoanalyze that impulse, but I, I guess I would say that um, you certainly can hear and read and feel a sort of value system of that poet's subjectivity in saying, I'm looking at the world and I think there's more to value and there's more to art than feelings or sort of traditionally high poetic subjects. And that in the process of sort of stripping away heavy laden symbols and things like that, you actually get a much sort of cleaner sense of what's important to this particular person. Yeah, I think that, Venetia, we're going to turn back to you right now in a sec. I'm just going to comment here, and then uh, I'd love to hear your response to these responses. Um, by the time we get to 1905, 1910, 1913, 1914, late Victorian and Edwardian poetry was so verbose, so hyper-rhetorical, so overblown, so reaching for the $5 adjective, and it had become... If, if, if it had become more emotionally accessible, easy emotions, Hallmark card kind of things, the late Victorian version of Hallmark, here I'm going to make you feel, oh, 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 this person that I loved has died in fancy terms, and you're supposed to feel. These poets are reacting against the easy, easiness and the easy accessible emotionality of that kind of poem, and they were trying to start over so that the Baroness Elsa von Freitag Loringhoven, who's a hero of next week's discussion, one of them, as, along with Gertrude Stein, decides that it's on Valentine's Day, she, you should say it with, is it bolts? Mm -hmm. Say it with bolts. <laughs> that, that's the, a riff on the uh, flower industry, which set the rose industry, which says it with flowers. Say it with flowers, and if you deliver flowers on Valentine's Day, you're participating in a cliche, and the person who receives the flowers might be emotionally moved, but these poets are saying, that is an easy, accessible symbol, and what we need to do is redo the rose, the rose is obsolete. So they're really, they're really reacting against uh, a slippage of poetry into conventionality of emotion. Anyway, Yes. So another thing I would say is that it, let's not forget that this kind of stripping away does involve quite a bit more work on the reader's part because it's not enough for Williams to just present a wheelbarrow, an ordinary object, or the gross, gritty back wings of the hospital. Or and, a urinal. Or a urinal, right? And say, this is, a, this is a beautiful thing. We also have to participate in deciding that it is. Yes. So where sentimentality in like Victorian terms is really easy because we've all sort of universally decided as a society that roses are nice and pretty and that they mean something. We then are asked in this sort of make it new early modern moment to participate in a whole new set of work. And it comes down to the fact that we didn't decide it. We didn't decide, it, <laughs> decide that roses mean this. It got decided for us. We should decide things for ourselves. Poetic value. Venetia, how's it going? I'm just so pleased that I called, and um, what's running through my head is, you know, I know we've been talking about, um, you know, cubism and, and, and painting and, and other art forms and how they are in um, dialogue with poetry, and I'm thinking, I'm a video producer is my, is my day job. Wait, you're and a, I'm did you say a radio producer? Video. Video producer, got it. I'm a video producer, yeah, and so I'm thinking about film and yeah. poetry um, based upon what you all were just speaking about. And I'm thinking about the difference between sort of like a 1950s epic Metro Golden Mare sort of, um, you know, uh, with swelling music and a huge uh, cast and guys get um, girls, guys get girls, right? It's like a, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's sentimental and it's, full of the rose. It's full of yes. the music in particular telling us how we should feel. Feel It swells at a certain point that's and then right. it dips and that's our cue. Oh, we should feel happy here or sad here. And then I'm thinking about that in contrast to indie films 
and right. how they're really they're really stripped down and they're they're free of a lot of you know they're absent a convention is is absent and the the viewer then is left to figure out for themselves I'm go. not maybe I'm not sure what's going on here with the character because I don't have a visual cue or I don't have a music cue and so as Anna said it requires more work for the viewer but it's ultimately in my mind completely more satisfying perfect analogy super helpful thank you Venetia is this your first time with Modpo did you say that it's my first time it is okay. is this your first webcast it's my first webcast yep okay and are you watching or are you just calling and listening I'm gonna watch when we hang up okay good well as a video producer, maybe you could give uh, Zach and Chris feedback on, on the quality <laughs> of the camera work and the uh, transitions. <laughs> now that, the, it's a, what we're doing is amazing, and uh, I hope you appreciate it as a professional. Thank I, you. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for calling. Wow, Venetia, that's great. Okay, 610-616-3208. Ray, what is on your mind? This is your seventh time through week three. What, what's been drawing your attention? What issues? Well, I, I particularly uh, am drawn to uh, the week where we do the images on uh, poets. Uh, and I relate this to um, Impressionism in French art. Yeah. Um, the, the, they, they, they happened almost kind of simultaneously. But moreover, and I, I just learned this at a museum art exhibit uh, recently, uh, the, the, um, the establishment, the sort of deep state of the, of the uh, art movement in France <laughs> all, all went to the same school, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And, uh, and, and when these new guys came on the scene, uh, Gauguin and Monet and all these people, uh, the, the uh, establishment said, that's not art, that's an impression of art. Yeah. And hence the word impressionism. I didn't know the origin of that, that's yeah. cool. Um, so in, that, there's an analog. But I'm thinking about another analog. Of all places, Donny Hathaway, on, who has a Philadelphia connection, uh, in the liner notes to one of his albums, talks about uh, Sat Eric Satie and Ravel, and how they changed the music about the same time that the French Impressionists were changing yeah. um, uh, art. And it happened in poetry. Yes. And that's kind of cool. Yes. Yeah. So you're saying something about the concurrence of modern ideas, but you're also saying something probably about the way, the, what we call it, the inter-arts, the way the arts mm. relate to each other. And a lot of people le are into the painting thing and maybe even the music thing, but they don't realize that poetry changed in the same way, which is a shame. Um, Molly, hi. What's your, what are you thinking as you, for the seventh, and really I want to say ninth time, <laughs> uh, <laughs> work with this material? Uh, you go back to it every fall, and what's what's occurring to you right now about all this? Well, I read something recently about um, the urinal uh, that states that basically it was the Baroness who yeah. created that, and yeah. Duchamp later appropriated it. Isn't that, that like doubly ironic and weird? Yeah, and I feel like we haven't talked about that. Am I wrong? I don't think we, I think it got mentioned a couple of years ago, yeah, because that, that article's been floating around for a couple of years. Sure. Just to be clear, right, we're talking about how a week four poet, the Baroness, who was way, way, way out there, right? I mean, Duchamp was pretty far out there too, but um, Duchamp comes back from, allegedly from a hardware store with a urinal, turns it upside down, signs it, puts it in a, Get a show which rejected it and became, has become very famous because of it, partly, not to belittle that. And it turns out that maybe this poet, this Dadaist poet, who let's just say was a real Dadaist herself, it turned out that maybe she was the one who found or got or suggested the use of the urinal. How does that make you feel, Molly? It makes me feel a little bit upset. <laughs> And it makes me wonder where along the lines in Modpo um, similar things have occurred. Yeah, and I think when we get, that's great. When we get to chapter nine, 9.2 and 9.3 in particular, where conceptualists and aleatory poets are openly reusing others' materials, at least there's an honesty there. And I don't know. And then, and then Lily, it, that kind of relates to Williams not stealing a poem, but plums from his wife. 
Yeah, and also... That's uh, appropriation, isn't it? Yeah, well, I would say it's further than appropriation. Uh, the appropriation to me would be like taking Flossie's reply and publishing it as a poem or something. Right, but right. to me, the um, plums in the icebox is more about um, it's more about like power exerting power over someone. It's not the like you made something good and I'm going to steal it. It's like um, I have total dominion and control over everything that happens here, including the one thing that you were saving for yourself, despite all the work that you do, like, as evidenced in her reply to him, where she talks about all the food in the refrigerator, and teaches him how to make tea. She basically <laughs> she says, clear. all the other shit in the house is fine, but the plums yeah. <laughs> were mine. Yeah, so she's basically saying, like, he doesn't really take know how to take care of himself, and has the gall to take the one thing she was kind of saving to take care of herself, you know, like a yeah. treat for herself. So. And then made a big deal. Yeah, I mean, and became ca very His famous. career was kind of <laughs> launched. Yeah. Okay. Um, let us go and um, see what's being tweeted. Uh, Anna's in the forums, Ray's in the tweets, and Davey also, and Lily's got Facebook. Anna, one thing you're seeing there in the discussion? Um, so in the f we have some really interesting things happening in the forum, so if you're, you know, come, come hang. Um, but one really cool question that um, our old pal Anthony Risser posted earlier this morning um, was it's kind of a mega huge question about Williams and his like ascendancy in being studied. Anthony's wondering if Williams always was studied as much as he has been. And I suppose a way to kind of extend that question out further would be to ask why uh, do we continue to study Williams in the way that we do? I'll answer the first part, and then I'll turn to Davey to speculate maybe if you're okay on the second part. Um, the, I was an undergraduate at Colgate University, and in 19, I, came th I got there in 1974, and in 1977, I decided to do a senior project. This is, this is the 70s. We're not talking about the 50s. And I went to, and my professors, I thought, were very cool. And I went to them and I said, I think I'd like to do a senior thesis, this undergraduate senior thesis, on William Carlos Williams' epic poem, Patterson. And I was told, no, you can't do that. Now, we're talking William Carlos Williams, super canonized by now, and really canonized then. This was a you know, somewhat remote English department. Everybody there had gotten their, many of them had gotten their degrees in the 40s and 50s and some in the 60s. Williams died in 1963. So here I am, not that many years later after his death, suggesting this major modernist epic. I wanted to write, Davy about Patterson, the modernist epic, and the city. Patterson, New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. I don't expect very much. And I really wanted to write about my place. And they said no. And that no wasn't simply, hey, kid, you're from New Jersey. You think you're going to go to grad school doing that shit? You're not. It wasn't even, um, maybe you could do Elliot. It was more like, Williams? There's nothing there. This wasn't that long ago. So Williams is Anthony Risser. Williams is fairly, relatively new to the canon. Now, for the other side of the question as to whether Williams should be studied this much or why, he's, why he continues on, here's Davey for some thoughts. So we had a conversation about this. We, I think folks have mentioned in a webcast that Al is teaching a graduate seminar on ModPo and a, in dialogue with experimental pedagogy that's being co-taught by Lily, Anna, myself, and Amber Rose. And we had a conversation about a couple of different Williams poems, Red Wheelbarrow, and this is just to say, as poems that are often taught to middle and high school students who are roughly our age, 20s, 30s, and that many, many folks got those poems as a middle and high school age person, often as an example of close reading, of just like, we're gonna teach you how to close read, here's this canonical poem about some misogynist stealing some plums, and you know how I feel about this poem. And I wonder if its canonicity seems to have a lot to do with it being taken out of context. That it's a poem that's read as accessible in my understanding, such that it's very little of it to me is really accessible, but that little bit is what's taught. Such as as soon as you're having conversation about imagism or having conversation about its gender politics or having conversations about William's work 
as a larger body, that's a very different conversation. And that isn't a frame that high school teachers generally are given unless they seek it out. And so I feel like it's made accessible by being decontextualized, by being made something else. It's like a shadow version of itself. And that's something that it's been useful to talk about in ModPost to try to figure out how do we take this thing away from its like very flat, uninteresting shadow version and try to say something else about it. Or if it's there, how do we seek, how do we discern its or, original is the wrong word, its initial sure. boost yep. of radicalism? Yep. So when poets turned to Williams when he was emerging in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and they, they said, oh, well, you wouldn't want to read Williams. He, he does like poems as laundry lists or poems like shopping lists. I think that's when Mike Wallace, CBS Mike Wallace, interviewed Williams in the 50s, he said, your poems look like shopping lists. And rather than being insulted by that, he said, that sounds really great. Let me get home and write that poem. That is a gesture that, we're f that, we, that we admire because that is a big break from the whole thought that resolves itself and is beautiful and that Mike Wallace would understand. Whatever Mike Wallace wouldn't understand, I want to be a poem. Anyway, um, Lily, we're going to Facebook. How's that going? How are the Facebook people? They seem pretty good, fairly quiet, but um, I really liked something Pamela Joyce Shapiro said or, uh, nine minutes ago. I can see exactly when it was. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to read her comment. She said, Ashbery wrote, perhaps... John Ashbery. John yes. Ashbery wrote, perhaps we ought to feel with more imagination. I think these poets, imagists, do this very well, losing the cliche. They leave the reader to feel in the moment without dictating what to feel. That's really, really well said. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ray, how are the tweets? Are uh, you keeping up? Usually you're Mr. Tweet. I know, I know. And it's hard to tweet and keep up with the tweets, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Okay, thank uh, you. We've got a couple of good tweets from Sanjeev, who's been with us for... Forever. Forever. Um, Sanjeev uh, tweets about Duchamp and the Baroness and that urinal, and he's got two good links. And it, it, uh, it, it, it reminds me that not only the tweets, but uh, these webcasts are chock full of metadata that we don't capture. Yeah, how do we capture the metadata? We need to crowdsource. We need to come, out, come up with a way where we manually do it. Do you know, I just got shivers. That's how dweeby I am. That he's <laughs> talking about capturing metadata, and I get all excited. I'm going <laughs> to cry. Ray, you're the best. Um, you're really devoted to what we're doing, and crowdsourcing has, from the beginning, we'll just call it democracy, intellectual democracy, has been your thrust for all these years. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm honored that you're part of the community, and thank you, Sanjeev. Um, Jason hasn't, well, you, you know, I'm putting check marks next to people who've gotten a chance to talk, and you haven't had a chance to talk. Can I throw something at you, or do you want to just talk about what's on your mind? Um, uh, both. <laughs> no, 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 only one. Um. <laughs> you get, give me something to talk about. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say. Oh, you're going to get both. Go ahead. My office hours tonight. Okay, what time is your office hour tonight? Uh, 8 o'clock. The office hours have been great. I've been dropping in. Um, Dave Poplar's have been scarce. Um, so take a look at Dave's time. Maybe the time isn't right. Um, and I think Max is, no, I think Max had, no, Max had one where there weren't a lot of people. So, you know, there's a lot of us out there and we're all fabulous. So please join us. Jason's is tonight. All right, Jason, I am going to, ready for this? Are you ready? Sure. Okay. I'm going to read Ray Armand Trout's poem, Anti-Short Story. And I just want you to say a word or two about it. And do we have anybody on the phone? Okay, so it's 610-616-3208. 610-616-3208. Okay, Ray Armand Trout's anti-short story, which is in Modpo Plus. I'm going to ask you to comment briefly on it, and then I'm going to ask Jonah to comment as well, since he's got the mic. All right? That's the fate of the mic holder. <laughs> anti-short story. By the way, Ray has said to us, that she was very influenced by imagism, and P Williams in particular, at the start. 
I should also adore uh, HD. You can read Cheshire Poetics to and learn Cheshire more about Poetics that in Monpo Plus. Yes. Yeah. And I'll also plug this. Ray Armentrout herself will be here for a webcast in October, 17. October 17th, which is really exciting. Ray will be here. I think we were talking about the Beats, which is not really her where her bread is buttered, but she's, she's studying and excited, and I can't wait to hear what Ray has to say so about excited. the beats. <laughs> it's gonna be, this is definitely gonna be worth capturing the metadata yeah. about. Okay, anti-short story. A girl is running. Don't tell me she's running for her bus. All that aside. One more time, and then Jason, and then Jonah. A girl is running. Don't tell me she's running for her bus. All that aside, Jason. Well, one thing that strikes me about the poem is um, the use of the first person and don't tell me yeah. ab about the bus. Yeah which implies which implies a kind of speaker that's attempting to pre prevent itself from becoming a, a a kind of all all seeing right subjective speaker who doesn't want to know about the bust because she the the speaker simply wants to be dazzled by the sight of the girl running. Yes, beautiful. Uh, and, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and what is so interesting, I think, to track in the Imagist poems is the presence of pronouns like uh hd uses your when speaking like to the object mm. um and williams often does not use any pronouns that would that could possibly identify the location of the speaker um and so but I think that what matters is that all of these images images are generated by someone's attention. Yes. And the attention that they kind of lavish on an object or a short span of time is pr pr profoundly subjective. Yeah. Um, Jason, behind you, I don't know if you realize this, but behind you is a framed, we're seeing a framed exclamation point, and that is mm -hmm. how I feel about <laughs> you. Um, talking about the pronouns in relation to this poem is, is important. Jonah, because the speaker, as Jason just said, observes a girl running and really would prefer that it be left at that for all kinds of reasons. What are some of those reasons why a poet would prefer not to be told why she's running or to what she's running to? I just used two prepositions in a row. Jonah, hi. Uh, to, I guess, kind of answer that, um, I guess, it's in keeping with a lot of what we've been saying about uh, what is experimental, about experimental poetry, and um, that nothing should be kind of offered up to the reader ready-made. Um, I mean, the creative writing student in me reads the sentence, don't tell me, and like sees, here's the negative, show me, but uh, that doesn't seem to you, be... You just delighted that thing about creative writing workshops, which you should spell out a little bit. The famous line of the fiction writing seminar teacher is? Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. Um, so tell is really, that's anti-short story. She's really directing herself 
against creative writing pedagogy. Right, um, but I'm also not sure if what she's saying is show me either, uh, at least in terms of the she's running for her bus. The, the destination doesn't seem as important as the, the why is the girl running. Yes. Um, but also something uh, Jason had mentioned about that me uh, makes me think that this poem is kind of like a bit of flash fiction. <laughs> and that the me is the, is the main character of yeah. the poem in a way. Um, Erica and Molly, I want to turn to each of you on this question of anti-short story as briefly as possible. Um, so Jonah has teed it up. The question is, is there an urgency? Is there an ethical or political dimension to why Ray, aside from attacking the institution of creative writing, as to why Ray really wants us to figure out why the girl is running ourselves? Erica first. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm gonna answer that question, but what I'm interested in with this poem is what happens in the white space between the two line stanza and all that aside. Yeah. Because I wonder if that's actually where the story is. Ah, interesting. I've always taken all that aside to mean that's beside the point. Leave that, leave that off to the side. And you're saying something different, aren't you? I'm, I'm just, I don't know that I'm saying something different. I'm just saying that it's really interesting to me that there's that stanza break there. Yes. Molly, what's your thought about this? Why is it so urgent that we not identify for the reader why the girl is running? Uh, I'm not sure I'll get to why, but I think um, the answer there is in the exclamation point. You know, when we see all that aside, there's usually a comma at the end of it. Yeah. And then comes the explanation or the resolution of the statement. Right. Um, and instead, exclamation point just gives us that very clear, like, set that aside. This is not about that. Um, which I, leaves it really open to interpretation. I think... Jason must have added that exclamation point to this poem. <laughs> Davey, if oh, we... Oh, the exclamation yep. point is from Maud Poe in San Francisco at the center for the book. Oh, cool. That's right, you were there, you showed up. Yeah. You were doing readings out there, that's very cool. Davey, one more minute on this and then we'll move on. We'll, we'll go back to forums and tweets and things. Um, if we're in a court of law, or let's say a Senate, Senate hearing, and I'm asking questions about what we know, I, am going, I want the witness to, es be es to establish that the girl is running. I'm not particularly interested in what any one witness can tell us definitively why. It, it, it's kind of a standard prosecutorial situation in in judicial, the judicial environment, which is tell us what you saw. Don't, you're not in a position to tell us why. Because if, you do, if you're not in a position to tell us why and you tell us why, you may be solving the problem incorrectly as to why the girl is running. Does this make any sense to you? Am I pushing this too hard? Is, I see this as an ethical poem. I see this as a poem about the girl, saving the, rescuing the girl from incorrect assumptions about why she's running. We're rescuing the girl, but we're also at the risk of overreading, rescuing our reader selves. And I mean, I'm, I'm with you on this being an ethical poem. And I think it's also a poem that's like a classic Mod Poe poem, pedagogical, in the sense that it's trying to decouple noticing and interpreting, which is really hard for students to do. My students this semester were really wrestling with that, reading uh, the Eileen Miles poem, Writing, yesterday. Eileen Miles poem, Writing, which is in the Mod Poe syllabus. Is in the Mod Poe syllabus, and it was really hard for my students, and I think students of this Ray Armentrout poem, to identify what's happening without tying or suturing their identification to an interpretive move. And that's an ethical gesture, and it's also a feminist gesture to say, and like, this is already a poem in which we're gendering someone else. Like, we're already doing some interpretive work of not saying, I see a person who's running. I've identified that person as a girl. That's a girl-identified person. And so it's trying to think about how much can you observe without that naming being a kind of 
argumentation or interpretation. Where is that line? And it's not anywhere clear. Right. It has everything to do with imagism, too. It's not just a, a bash against creative writing pedagogy. It's also a concern about getting back to the imagist idealism of what HD does with the sea and the land, which is just not interested in assigning to it any motive other than what is fact, what is inevitable, what is natural, what is true. Yeah. Um, Anna, there's something in the thread that interested you in the, in the forums. Am yeah. I right? Yeah. I, can I just iterate how fucking brilliant that was? <laughs> what Davey just said. Davey makes yes, me well, emotional like once a webcast. Are you emotional about I am. that? <laughs> okay, so Venetia, there's your answer. Wh how, wh where the humanity comes back in. It comes back in Ooh. when we work hard together. You know, in this democratic spirit that Ray's been talking about, where we work hard together to do the work, that's moving. Holy shit, sure is. Okay, more exclamation um, points. I think we should have a little exclamation point buttons that everybody gets. That's a thing. We can okay. make that a thing. All right. Um, can I say that I'd like, if Connie is willing to get the mic, and Ray uh, to respond to whatever Anna is, this might be hard, but to respond to whatever Anna's bringing up here. Yeah, I mean, there's just there's so many good questions in the forums, but this one I thought was particularly fitting given the conversation we were just having. Um, but Lisa wants to know, can we read images poems as meta? And maybe we should take a second to define what that is. Um, it seems that, let's continue reading her question, it seems that that was against their manifesto, yet some poems this week seem to have meta qualities. For example, HD's Sheltered Garden, which a couple of people have brought up as an exciting poem to them this week. So, Wow, Sheltered Garden is meta. Oh, boy. OK, before we get to Sheltered Garden, let's deal with the general issue. OK, so we have Ray and Connie. Ray, if, for instance, uh, we take a poem like Sea Rose, HD Sea Rose, which seems to be a description as precise as possible of a rose that's kind of sea and land, you know, kind of waving around in the sea, very precise, kind of an ugly little rose, not the beautiful American beauty rose. How could that be meta? How could that be about poetry? It seems to be trying not to be about itself. It's trying not to be self-involved poetry, poetness, and yet we always say it is. What the heck's wrong with that? Well, now it's a tough I'm, question. It, it is. I'm not. I'm no expert. Uh, I don't have academic training in. Listen, you've had poetics. seven years. That, <laughs> you should have a PhD. All in favor of Ray Maxwell <laughs> earning a PhD, say aye. But I didn't hear any eyes. Aye. Uh, 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 okay. But By the power invested in me. <laughs> but I, I think it's the case, and I use it in my in my um in, in my study group where we do um we analyze and, and close read uh, dramatic. Dra dramas, uh, I think it's a case that... This is a time to plug it. Can you plug it? Yeah, August Wilson. Uh, we, do, uh, we have a study group, and we're doing all 10 plays of August Wilson over an 11-week period, um, uh, period, and we hit every play. And uh, what's and really amazing... that's in Washington, D.C.? That's in Washington, D.C. And how do they, if someone's interested, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, well, it's not exactly open. You have to be in Washington. Uh, but there's a, uh, there's a program called OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute. It's called ollie-dc.org. Uh, and they have hundreds of classes uh, that people uh, take. Okay. And I, I, I propose uh, this August Wilson class. The, 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 the thing that ties August Wilson to what we're doing in poetry is that August Wilson wrote poetry for years before he ever wrote a play. Mm. Uh, he wanted to be a poet. Uh, but he wrote a play for, a, he wrote a skit for a museum, and he said, hey, I like this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, I, think, I think we can go in with the entering assumption that all poetry is autobiographical, all poetry is ethnographical, and all poetry is metapoetic. I think that's an, an assumption that we make. Um, and then we search to find the ways that it satisfies those, that, that framework. I'll just follow up question, then I want to go to Connie. When you hear Modpo people, particularly people new to the course, and they say, wow, this course is obsessed with meta poetry, can't you guys get away uh, from that self-involvement, that, nar that elite narcissism, like 
all poets have to be writing about poetry. Why does this course always feature the word this, referring to the poem itself? Why can't we just write poems about things, poems that tell stories, poems about other people? Uh, is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the, um, the cool thing for me about poetry is that um, poetry sits at the sort of intersection, almost the precipice between um, the oral tradition uh, and the written word. Um, poetry is easy to remember because it, it rhymes, or it has rhythm, or it has meter, um, or, or it, it fits together even in its abstractness. Poetry is easy to remember, uh, and so it sort of contributes to the, the oral transmission of information. But poetry is written, and so it sits at that intersection. Um, and thank God it does because we have poetry to study that we haven't necessarily heard read um, from poets that have, that have come and gone. That's a great answer. Thank you, Ray. Connie, any thought on this question of meta? Why, why, why focus on meta poetry? What's, what's to be gained from that? I don't know if I have an answer to that because that he had such a good answer for that, but <laughs> could I go back to the sea rose for a minute? To what? The sea, sea rose. rose, yes. Yeah, because um, yep. you mentioned the sea rose doesn't seem to be about itself, but my question for you would be, how do you know that the sea rose isn't trying to be about itself? Because aren't we then coming in with assumptions that it's not about itself? Like when I read it and I see the word rose repetitively, it seems to be like a person who doesn't want to conform or who's living between an edge. But then doesn't that make, well, then can we make the assumption that the poem itself is the rose? Mm. I, I don't know if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That's great, Connie. Thank you so much. Um, I think Lil is going to take a crack at responding to that. Yeah, I think um, I missed what, I sort of missed what the, question about um, assuming the rose is about itself. I like blanked out for a second, but I, I forgot, I missed the part that you were responding to originally, but I like what you said. <laughs> um, I, see, I see the, the meta poetry that I see in the rose, uh, see rose poem is more uh, content related actually, and it's about the symbol of the rose. And so if you're writing about, if you're using poetry to talk about how a symbol ha is no longer meaningful, that's a common symbol of poetry, like that is metapoetic, even though it's more a content reading, I don't know, a content approach to looking at metapoetry rather than saying like um, a grammatical approach or, or saying like, oh, these pronouns key us into the fact that this is a poem about poetry or, um, or whatever it is. So like the fact that she's, just the fact that she's writing a different kind of rose and that the fact that rose is such a heavily meaning uh, uh, connotative meaning type of a word to put into a poem like that's the meta poetry there for me I think that's that's really great Anna quick word on this might be useful to think about a visual art comparison too because um, so much of the art the visual art painting that was done sort of before for radical experiments in painting in like the second half of the 19th century and into the 20th and 21st, um, artists tried really hard to um, erase the boundary between painting and real life and tried really hard to use illusion and pers like two point, three point perspective to ma make viewers forget that what they were looking at was a painting. And I think as we move into the later half of the 19th and 20th centuries, artists instead assert that what they're working with is paint on a two-dimensional surface. And poems that do that same work are not trying to make you forget that what you're reading is, is a collection of words. And that um, ends up being tremendously exciting because instead of forgetting that that's what you're doing, you're, you get like losing yourself in a novel, for instance, Instead, you're drawn into the language and you're asked to look at the process of how those words were put together and the way in which they were put together. Um, and that, to me, is a much more sort of dynamic and animating and, and interesting way to think about words and language. It's a, it's a 
way of reading that asks you to constantly be defamiliarized with the way that you typically use language. Yes. Uh, I want to say one more thing about this, but I also want, right after that, for Lily to quote somebody in Facebook, Ray to quote a tweet, Davey to quote a tweet. Um, and also, I just remind you, maybe because we gave away the book to the first caller, nobody else is interested, but I know that's not true. 610-616-3208, 610-616-3208. My word on this, I really love this topic, so I'm glad it, it was brought up. Um, the minute she s starts a poem, rose, comma, harsh rose, everyone who reads the poem in 1912 or whenever it was first published, 1915, Everyone who reads it is going to say, wait a minute, here's a poem about a rose that's not about a beautiful rose? How could you use the word harsh? Roses are not supposed to be harsh in poems. It's a version of what you just said. This so goes against what readers of poetry at the time and still today, alas, think poems should do, which is to give us something beautiful not to make the world seem ugly, stunted with small leaf. What? You're not going to write about a stunted rose. You're supposed to write about a beautiful rose. And simply by doing that, she is daring us to say, this isn't a poem. And it is no different and no less radical a gesture than putting a urinal in a gallery show and saying that's art. It is actually more radical in a sense because she's doing it from within the Trojan horse of the poems about roses. Whereas Duchamp was operating as an outsider and he basically said, fuck you, I dare you to call this art, I know you won't call it art. She's saying, I really think this is beautiful. I think this is what beauty is. Let us talk about redefining beauty. Uh, Facebook post, then tweets. Lily, Facebook? Yeah. Um, I. Like what Marcus Balassi said. Um, hey, about, Marcus. Oh, hey, How Marcus. are you? <laughs> um, about anti-short story. Um, he said, to me, anti-short story is asking us to strip our narrative impulse from what we perceive. I think that's why it fits with imagism, getting to what is seen, seen rather than our automatic story making about it, which perhaps distances us from what's happening. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Ray, a tweet that interests you, or two? Okay, we have a couple of uh, digital soldiers out who are looking <laughs> for the, the um, tracing the metadata for us. Ooh. And in fact, um, Kathy Garges and Sanji both came in with uh, sources for the Mike Wallace, William Carlos Williams great. interview. Mm. Apparently, Perfect it's, it's not available by, um, by, by audio. Um, but it was posted in the New York Post in, let's see, the 50s. Uh, October 18th, 1957. Wow. And it was reprinted in a New Directions book in 1976 that Sanjeev sent us a link to in JSTOR. Hmm. So we have people, we have digital soldiers out there doing the I work. I think this is great. <laughs> this is real crowdsourcing. And I also think that he quoted, I believe he quoted from that interview in the fifth book of Patterson, which was 1958. I think, I think he actually quoted the interview partly to mock it. Uh, Davey, a tweet that interests you, or two? Yeah, uh, Elaine Ruth White asks this question, which I found really helpful. Is a poet confined by responding to a previous moment in the tradition of their own culture, or is it acceptable for a poet from another culture to respond, for example, an Irish poet responding to Whitman or Dickinson? which I found to be a, a really wonderful and useful question and in dialogue with a conversation that T and I were having in the Twitter feed for the last webcast of trying to think about what is the transnational reception of American poetry? What are the ways productive and unproductive absorbed and refused that American poetry reappears in and is in dialogue with transnational Anglophone literary traditions? Yeah, uh, in that context, I just want to point out that in ModPo Plus, we don't have a video yet of it, but we are going to do one soon. So Tom Leonard, this mm -hmm. radical anarchist, pacifist anarchist, uh, Scottish poet, uh, t wrote 
not too long ago, like in 2007 or 8, he wrote a poem that is a rejoinder to Williams' This Is Just To Say. Yeah. It's called Just To Let You Know. Um, I am not good at uh, braid Scots. I am bad at braid Scots. But um, the very first CCCR, Collaborative Close Reading, uh, Community Collaborative cl Close Reading video that was made, was made in November of 2012 by three poet slash poet friends in Edinburgh. They got together at one of their houses. They sat around a kitchen table. Uh, Sean Donnelly convened them. And they did a Modpo copycat video. This was the first time that had happened. We didn't even know enough about what the hell we were doing with this MOOC to know what that would mean. At first I thought, that's not very nice. This is, like, we did this. Are they copying it? And then I realized what they were doing was they were telling us that Williams and, Mo and Modpo are great, but that they have something to say in a language that they would not say is English, right? And they insisted and they do it in a very friendly way. In fact, they, I've, in, I've, I've kind of by email interviewed all three of them to rethink what they were, to, to just ask them what they think about it now. And they thought they were basically applauding Modpo. If you look at that video, you will see what they're saying is basically that Williams is to the American language is to Modpo as Leonard is to Braid Scott or to the Scottish language the Scottish version of English, sorry to use that phrase, uh, is to uh, a version of Modpo that they were on offer, that they were offering, which was a radical Scottish version of it. And the poem itself is not about a, taking a plum, it's about a Tom Lettern figure lying around on a couch on a day when there's gonna be a party, taking the specials, the beer, the Scottish beer, that you were apparently saving for the party and drinking the beer in advance. It has the same dynamic. And I won't do the Braid Scott, but it seems to me germane to the question that Davy and T have been talking about, which is, we are studying the American, in this case of Carlos Williams, we are studying the American language, we're focusing on American, uh, US concerns, and to some degree North American concerns, but there, is an, there are Englishes, plural, out there those spoken in countries where, like the Philippines, where English is not the primary language, and in countries like Scotland, where the word English to describe the language is refused, yet the poetic tradition is the same. Uh, I can't do this accent, but I'll try. Uh, just to let you know, I've drunk the specials that were in the fridge, and that you're probably holding back for the party, all right, they were great, that strong, that cold. Uh, that to me raises fundamental questions, Davey, about what we're doing here. We cannot operate in isolation, even from the Englishes that are out there. Quick comment in response to any of that, Davey, and then we'll move on. Yeah, and that's, we can't also operate in isolation from the fact that all of the work that we're teaching is necessarily implicated in systems of power, whether those are systems of power that are uh, located in an American context or part of uh, colonial and neocolonial legacies, and trying to think about how is experimental poetry often a refusal of a refutation of language being used to control. We'll get to that with the language poets very explicitly. But then also, what does it look like to be writing poetry that refuses systems of power in a language that's often a language of yes. marshalling or abusing power. And in the instance that I just gave, we get it this way. Yeah. The hegemony of English, British English, uh, overwhelming Scotland, mm -hmm. so that you get poems like, poets like Robert Burns are saying, no, that's not our English. Right? And there are lots of Scottish writers who decide to write in English. Yeah. Scottish nationalism is a radicalism, unlike mm -hmm. in other countries. Sure. Okay, when you respond to Williams by saying the hegemony of modernism, this is just to say, is a hegemony that the Americans can say they don't participate in because it's, the colonialism is coming from England. Yeah. 
but by having Anglo-American modernism, even Williams, who's like Mr. American speech, is participating in that hegemony. So the Leonard is beautifully triangulating English English, British English, and American English, and saying, you can't claim to escape that, Bill Williams, and yet, I'm going to do it. And what those three mod pullers were saying in a very gentle way is, be aware that those kinds of colonial triangulations are going to happen with English, even with cool experimental modernism. And that's even aside from the critique that Lily and others put on that poem, which is you took the plums that Flossie was saving, and Tom Leonard is talking about someone taking the beer that presumably his partner went out and bought, and now he's drunk it, and we have to go out and get some more, and guess who's going to have to do it? Okay, well, thank you. It was great. What, let's um, go around and get final words from everybody. Uh, so I think we're ready for that. And I didn't warn anybody we were doing that. So I'm looking around to see who's got a final word. And Anna's always good for a final word. Something, some, some thought. Uh, we're going to ballyhoo and cheerlead Stein for next week. You could use your final word to do that. But I think you should also be free to do something about this week. So Anna, your thought? Um, all I'll say is that if you want to come hang with me during your lunch hour tomorrow or your breakfast hour or your dinner hour, whatever time it is for you at 12 o'clock Philly time, that's my office hour. It'd be great to see you. Um, and I came across this uh, really amazing parody of Williams's Between Walls this week on McSweeney's, and I just wanted to read it. Between Walls. Between Walls. And I won't read it in Williams' voice even though. No. <laughs> The back wings of the hospital, where nothing will grow, is a good place to hide from all sorts of people. <laughs> Including Bill Williams, the doctor. Including Bill Williams. Okay, it's from uh, William there. Cross Williams' Poems for Introverts. Okay. And Williams has spawned an entire industry of rejoinders, which is a great thing. We're going <laughs> to so read one, Kenneth Koch's rejoinder. Yeah. Okay. Lily, final thought? Yeah, just thinking more about what, um, what Davey the question Davey brought to the table. Um, I just feel really strongly that no one should be excluded from like responding to material, po po poetry that came before them, like regardless of how famous or canonized it seems just because of like where they were born or what language they speak or whatever, because it's really important to remember that like that whole, whole circles of poets were very like even if they were very radical, they're still very closed off and like writing letters to each other and collaborating with each other and thinking about whose voices got, who, who they got to come into contact with and whose experiences they were reflecting and representing. It's really, I think there should be no, there's no um, uh, statue limitation on like <laughs> when you can respond to Whitman or when you can respond to something that came long before you. And I think it's, the most important thing like contemporary poets could do is to continue making those responses even if they're negative critiques. Like I just loved that question because I think it's important. We don't want to participate in more canonizing than we already um, just have to by the nature of putting together a course. So, Thank you, Lily. Uh, Ray, thanks for making the trip. Uh, I hope you have other things to do in Philly today. Perhaps. <laughs> oh, perhaps, okay. Uh, Ray, final thought? Uh, just to, I want to put in a pitch for uh, our reading out loud study group. Uh, and it relates to what we're talking about now. Which is in the discussion forums. It's in the discussion yep. forums. And we have people from Scotland and England and Ireland and you know, in several places in the United States reading mod pull poems uh, on their computers, uploading them to various um, programs, mm -hmm. and posting them to uh, the discussion group. And so it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And one other thing uh, while we're talking about uh, English language. There's this, um, there's a poem in week seven, I think we do, by Frank O'Hara, uh, the, the Day Lady Died, yeah. where he talks about going out and buying the cigarettes and going to check out what the Ghanaian poets are yeah. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, English is spoken in a lot of different places. I yes. mean, the sun never settled in the British Empire at one yeah. time. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Ray. Oh, okay, so we're gonna go to uh, Erica. Uh, Erica had to leave. She had to leave, okay, so Molly, final thought? I just want to put in a plug for our Southern California meetup. It's this Sunday at noon at Bulletproof Coffee in the Arts District. So um, I hope anyone who's in the area will come and join us and we'll do some close reading. You'll get a nice crowd. You always get a nice crowd there. Thank you, Molly. That's great. It's good to see you. Um, Jason, final thought? Um, I want to plug my office hour tonight. 
starting at 8 o'clock Eastern Coast USA time. And I'm, I'm really intrigued by a tweet from Aymir Laffin. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing the first name wrong. But it says, how much work is happening in that, uh, quote, anti-dash title? And I, I think what is kind of fascinating about anti-short story is that Armin Trout tells us what not to think about rather than simply taking control and focusing on the, the girl running and not giving us that other voice that says um, she's running for the bus. Yeah. And, um, and just uh, to pick up on discussions of feminism, I um, would be very curious to do research on the ways in which females were allowed to have um, access to being printed, such as Emily Dickinson, who did not become a famous person in her time, but also, and with the urinal, like, could the Baroness have submitted that herself rather than having a man submit it? Um, and did HD doing a kind of radical poetics have to pick primarily flowers and, and bucolic things even though they may be ugly, they're still flowers mm. before she moves on to her more explosive myth poems. These are all rhetorical questions. Yes. And I, I bring them up just to suggest to everyone to have that in context because Gertrude Stein is going to come in and flip over the tables and say, so I'm a woman and I don't have to conform to anything. Thank you. And what table? She might even ask. Table? Um, I want to go to Davey, and then I want to invite Beat, if you don't mind, to have a final thought, and we'll get the mic to you, and then I have a few announcements, and we'll go. Davey? I wanted to shout out kind of a throwback uh, poem talk from early 2009 that was uh, Nada Gordon, Lawrence Joseph, and Charles Bernstein talking about the Wallace Stevens poem, Not Ideas About the Thing, but the Thing Itself. There's a link to it in Modpo Plus, and it's a really spectacular conversation. I listened to it for the first time when I uh, listened to then all of the poem talks that had been made before I came to Penn. When I knew I was coming to Penn, I walked around in the snow in Iowa for like five months and with your voice in my headphones well, that out. That is frightening. Isn't it weird? Uh, but it's a really awesome conversation. And if you're wishing that we had talked more about Stevens or wanting to hear other folks on the week three poets, they have a great conversation about There's it. There's a bonus at the end of that episode. Do you remember what it is? I don't remember. So during the uh, Gathering Paradise segment, Nada Gordon mm -hmm. read a Flarfist right. translation of Stevens. Yeah. Not ideas about the bling, but the right. bling itself. Oh man, it was good. Okay, B, your final thought? Hi. Hi. Oh, it's long. Um, I guess I've been thinking throughout about um, Venetia's comment at the beginning uh, about what's the human part of these poems. Um, and when Davy was talking about refusal, it kind of made me think about the way that we refuse all the time in our relationships and in conversations and how refusal can be like a big political act to uh, you know, not engage with a certain kind of language or not reveal a certain kind of content. But 
it can also be just maybe you know, the way that I engage in a conversation with someone and choose what to withhold and what to, um, mm. and what to express. Um, and so maybe that is one of the human parts of, the po of poems that are withholding a lot or that are harder work. I really like that. Thank you so much. I mean, one of the reasons why I love to go to the Arnsberg Rooms at the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, is to stand in front of paintings that nobody at first glance understands and then to hear them talk among themselves about why they don't think it's a painting or why the hell, and then to once in a while, not too often, to be part of that conversation. And that is part of what the art is meant to create, which is a conversation about its status as art. And that's what Mob Poe is. Okay, four quick announcements for me. First, uh, Mandana is convening w the first New York City meetup Saturday, this Saturday the 29th at noon. And if you need to know information, just go inside m the Mod Poe discussion forums, go to study groups and meetups, and you'll find the New York group there. Two, I wanna plug CCCR syllabus, which is crowdsourced video close readings. Uh, please organize yourselves, let us know, we'll help you through that. Third, I just wanna just stipulate that all this week we need to cheerlead to each other that we're reading Stein for next week, that it's Gertrude Stein, 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 where a rose is not simply a stinted sea rose, but it's a rose and a rose and a rose, it is itself. Stein, 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 please stay with us. Don't drop out of the course because of Stein. I mean, Ray, he's, been, he's, he's, he's here seven years later. Stein didn't kick him out. And finally, a shout out to Maureen Bailey. Um, Maureen is a perfect example of one of the fabulous ModPo community members. She's from a small town in southwestern Manitoba, Canada. 60 years old, she says, has had very little uh, exposure to poetry, stumbled on Mod Poe in 2016, so this is her third session. Everything was fresh and new. Watching the videos made me feel part of the discussion, like I was in a classroom, and they gave me a lot to think about. And here's the reason I'm quoting Maureen, other than to shout out and to welcome her again to the community. She says, close readings are amazing, but I struggle when trying it myself. Let's pause on that. That's how I began when I was talking about one of the essayists. Um, that struggle is good. We don't want to solve the problem any more than we want to identify why the girl is running. We, in our videos, we want to leave it as much open as possible. We also want to just put some poems out there that you have to struggle with. You're not really alone. You can do, do it with others. Uh, she says she's not as articulate as most of you. This, this post itself defies that. It's very articulate. The discussion forums are filled with wonderful ideas and suggestions that I enjoy reading, but I don't think I'm ready yet to post my own thoughts. This is a meta post because she said she wasn't ready to post her own thoughts, and she did. Thank you for enriching my life. P.S. I was in New York City in March 2017, and I made a point of going to the Morgan Library to see the Emily Dickinson exhibit. I felt so connected to the Mod Po world. Okay, just let's get, get that straight. Maureen from southwestern Manitoba does Mod Po three years. In the second year, travels to New York, sees none of us, connects to Emily as posted there, having seen the videos we did there and feels connected to us. That is like what we want. There's a, a beautiful museum and library. There's videos done on site. She's still not met us, but she feels connected. I just want to say that that's a good deal. Uh, thank you, everybody, Ray, for coming long distance. Anna, Jess, you, welcome back to North America. Thank you, everybody. And Chris and Zach, they were here at 7.30. It is now 11.30, almost four hours of effort. Snaps for Chris and Zach. Please uh, tweet, tweet people. Please tweet. Make sure you tweet their tweet handles so that they're flooded with thank yous for the work that they do. This is the best live interactive webcast anywhere. It's certainly the best live webcast on modern experimental poetry anywhere today. This, but, I think we can say that. But more than that is the best fucking webcast, live webcast anywhere. Nobody does it better than these two. We're gonna be challenging them next week by showing up in Canada 
trying to put together a live webcast on Thursday at 6.30 Montreal time. We'll see you then. Have fun meantime in the forums, and have a good day.